Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this very important ceremony in which the newly appointed Attorney General of Jamaica, and based upon my research, I think he's the 12th Attorney General since independence, beginning with the Honorable Victor Grant, and he was immediately preceded by Honorable Marlene Malahu, Fort Queens Council, as Attorney General. The Office of the Attorney General has a long history that I'll be tracing the history from pre-medieval times to now. But nonetheless, over time, there are two offices that emerged from the deep mists of English history. I became established as the principal law officers of the Crown, that's the Attorney General and the Solicitor General. Suffice it to say that those two offices made their way to Jamaica via the colonial experience with the United Kingdom. And according to the information available, it indicated that in 1944, the Attorney General retained his position as a member of the Policymaking Executive Council, and this continued until 1957 when the Council of Ministers was established since the beginning of internal self-government. And from 1957, the Attorney General was the sole nominated member of the, what was known as the then Legislative Council. Now, the Attorney General as the Principal Law Officer of the Crown, before the advent of the Director of Public Prosecutions, was responsible for overseeing the matters of the Crown both in criminal proceedings, in criminal matters other than private prosecutions were brought in the name of the Crown, and also civil matters in which the Crown had an interest. Now, in Jamaica at 1962, the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions was presented or created or embodied in the 1962 independence constitution and so the responsibility for criminal matters shifted from the attorney general to the newly created office of the director of public prosecutions now there we have we seem to have developed mixed approaches to the office whether the Attorney General should be a cabinet member or should not be a cabinet member. We have had attorneys general who have been cabinet members. We have had some who have not been cabinet members. And so here we have Dr. McCoy, who is not a cabinet member, but attorney general. Now, our constitution speaks directly to the Office of the Attorney General, Section 79.1, says that there shall be an Attorney General who shall be the principal legal advisor to the government, and as such, has a significant role in the legal landscape. And up until 1813, at least in the United Kingdom, there was an issue in which we were seeking to determine the standing of the Attorney General in relation to the rest of the bar. And eventually in 1813, it was settled that the Attorney General is a leader of the bar. And so that is our position that we have adopted and continued to today. And so has preeminence when appearing in court with other members, even senior members of the bar. And so, in that context, 
it is only right and proper that the Attorney General be elevated to the rank of Queen's Counsel in order to enable him or her to discharge the many functions as efficiently as is possible. And so with those few words, I invite Honorable Minister of Justice, Mr. Delroy Chuck, Queen's Counsel, to propose Mr. Derek McCoy, Queen's Counsel. Thank you very much, um, my Lord Chief Justice, my Lord Frank Williams, my Lady, Ms. Carl Besby. First, let me say it's a pleasure to be in your court once again. Long time I have not been here. And on this occasion, it's such a great pleasure and privilege to be here to propose my good friend and colleague for quite a few decades. <laughs> now, Dr. Derek McCoy has been a teacher in the Faculty of Law for many decades. I was there for two decades. I started seeing him there, and then I left leaving him there. And he had an outstanding teaching career, my Lord Chief Justice, and he assisted in ensuring that a number of attorneys were well trained and educated in constitutional law. He and I, when we were together, we not only taught at the university faculty of law, but we also participated in quite a few trials. And that is where his advocacy skills really demonst was demonstrated. So, my Lord Chief Justice, I can say that at the bar, I have seen him in practice. He and I did quite a number of cases, and I can certainly say his advocacy at the bar is really of a high standard. Apart from his advocacy at the bar, my Lord Chief Justice, my good friend, Dr. McCoy, has written extensively. And not only has he written extensively on many issues, where others can benefit from his wide experience and education. But he has also served the government in many capacities, not only as contractor general, but he has also served as chairman of many commissions. He was a part of the Integrity Commission, and he has also served as chairman of the OUR and on several public bodies. His contribution, my Lord Chief Justice, to not only the public service, but to the legal profession, is one which make Dr. McCoy not only appropriate to be called to the inner bar, but also to lead the legal profession. And I have no doubt, my Lord Chief, that as Attorney General, and I was happy when he was appointed Attorney General, that he will be able to assist in ensuring that the legal profession gets the support and also the supervision that it deserves. So with these few words, my Lord Chief Justice, I propose that Dr. Derek McCoy be called to the inner bar. Uh, so Dr. Derek McCoy, you having been appointed as one of Her Majesty's Council for Jamaica, Will you please make the declaration? I, Derek Vincent McCoy, do declare that well and truly I will serve the Queen as one of her counsel learned in the law and truly counsel the Queen in her matters when I shall be called and duly and truly minister the Queen's matters and sue the Queen's process after the course of the law and after my cunning. For any matter against the Queen where the Queen is a party, I will take no wages or fee of any man, save as I shall otherwise be permitted. I will duly, in convenient time, speed such matters as any person shall have to do in the law against the Queen and as I may lawfully do without long delay, tracting and carrying the party on this lawful process, in that to me belongeth. I shall be attending to the Queen's matters, 
when I be called thereto. Well, at the invite, the Mrs. Marlene Aldred, Queen's Council Solicitor General, to robe the Attorney General. So Dr. Derek McCoy, Her Majesty the Queen, having appointed you as one of her counsel for Jamaica, will you please take your seat at the inner bar? And right I now invite Mr. Michael Hilton, Queen's Counsel, to address the court. Thank you, my Lord Chief Justice. My Lord, my lady, um, my Lord. I must first apologize for the absence of the chairman of the General Legal Council, Mr. Alan Wood, Queen's Council. He had very much wanted to be here, but um, given his inability to do so, he asked me to represent the council today. However, he asked me to convey his personal congratulations to Dr. McCoy on his admission to the inner bar. As your Lordship knows, the General Legal, Con the Legal Profession Act established the General Legal Council for, among other things, the, the express purpose of upholding standards of professional conduct. The important role played by the disciplinary committee is well known, but they only get involved after there have been alleged breaches of those standards. And the council is even more interested in preventing those breaches from taking place in the first place. And in that regard, my Lord, the Attorney General as leader of the bar and all Queen's Council as leaders in their own right play a critical role. Dr. McCoy brings a great deal to both positions. He is of unquestioned integrity as the learned Minister, Honorable Minister has pointed out, he has had a distinguished career, both practicing at the private bar and in the public sector, given the many positions that he has held. And what I think, um, Chief Justice, you, you went through the history of the office. What I think may be a first for the holder of this office is Dr. McCoy's academic history and contribution as a lecturer of law over a long period of time, including as dean of the faculty. I'd also add, um, my lord, that Dr. McCoy joined the General Legal Council upon his appointment as Attorney General and has already contributed significantly to our deliberations. If I may be permitted, my Lord Chief Justice, a personal comment. I have known Dr. McCoy for more than five decades and his wife. I've known him from a time when we both wore large afros and bell bottom pants. And I know that he has another attribute that is very important to the position he now holds. And that is, he is not afraid to speak truth to power. Dr. McCoy, the council wholeheartedly congratulates you on your appointment as Attorney General and on your admission to the inner bar. And we look forward to working with you as we both discharge our respective mandates. May it please you, my Lord. Thank you very much, Mr. Hilton. Mr. Alexander Williams. May it so please you, my Lord Chief, my Lord Williams, my Lord Deswick. Um, let me speak personally a little bit at the start to say that um, my criminal law lecturer and my constitutional law lecturer are now both Queen's Council. It's Mr. Delroy Chuck 
and my learned friend, Mr. Derek McCoy, Queen's Council. And I recall, and I think now it's about 32 years ago, when I sat bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, sopping up every morsel of law that I could possibly get from Mr. McCoy. Um, on behalf of myself and the Jamaican Bar Association, I have no hesitation in saying that there can be no better person to swell the ranks of Queen's Council than Mr. Derek McCoy. His public service, his contribution to the private bar are as long as my arm. Um, I decided to research some of what Mr. McCoy has been up to these many years, and I would hesitate, to, I would not hesitate again to say, my Lord, that if we should go through that list, we would be here until tomorrow. Um, I echo the sentiments of um, my learned friend and Queen's Council, Mr. Mike Hilton. I fully expect that our new Attorney General will speak truth to power. I have mentioned to him that I consider his appointment um, a convergence. That, I, that in short order, I suspect, constitutional matters will become high on the agenda of public discourse. And I cannot think of any more appropriate person than Mr. McCoy to assist and drive that debate. So, heartiest congratulations, sir. I look forward to or the continued dialogue um, between yourself and the Jamaican Bar Association for what is to come. And uh, I expect that Mr. McCoy will comport himself in such a manner as to have every single attorney aspire to become Queen's Council. May it so please you. Thank you. And to may I now invite Dr. Derek McCoy, Queen's Council, Attorney General of Jamaica, and I'm also told a graduate of Monroe, <laughs> hailing from the hills of St. Elizabeth to address the court. My Lord Chief Justice, my Lord, my Lady. My Lord Chief Justice, I'm, I'm indeed grateful that you found it possible to participate in this ceremony this morning. And your other judges, if you will allow, allow me a personal indulgence, I think I would say I have a personal connection to everyone, including yourself, on your bench. And it is deeply appreciated and very moving to me that you are presiding today. First, in response, I'd like to thank Mr. Michael Hilton, Queen's Council of the General Legal Council, and Mr. Williams of the Jamaica Bar Association. I would think, my Lord Chief Justice, this is a, a phenomenal honor and to be invited to be this position. No one would challenge that. But the fact that we require the General Legal Council and the Jamaica Bar Association to participate reminds us of the important roles they play in the development and protection of our profession. More often, my Lord Chief Justice, I, I should say I'm very, very pleased because I hold both Mr. Hilton and Mr. Williams in such high esteem. I would to thank Mr. Delroy Chuck, Queen's Counsel, a longtime friend and colleague. You heard Mr. Lord, my Lord. Uh, when he was asked for his papers, I think, last week, I, I facetiously said his instructions were to stand up, to say a few nice words about me, to purge himself by saying I'm a good lawyer, to invite you to invite me to sit in the Queen's Council's bench and to sit down. My Lord, I had no idea he would take the injunction to purge himself so seriously. But, <laughs> but, but I'm deeply grateful for the very kind words that he and, of course, the other, my other colleagues have said. I'd like to thank them very, very much. 
Mr. Chuck had not mentioned the exact location, but, but many years ago, we started practicing at, in chambers at 2 Duke Street. There were Lord Chambers in those days. And we shared them. And, I, and that is, I suspect, where our litigation practices began. And while it's quite possible, my Lord, that Mr. Chuck may have other ambitions, uh, I expect that, that my role at the Attorney General will be the last part of my career. And so I'm very honored that my learned friend, Mrs. Milleen Aldred, the Solicitor General of the Attorney General's Chambers, in fact, ruled me today. I, I, I deeply appreciate that she found time and effort. And I know how busy she is. The rest of you may not know how the man. Her job is that she took the time out, and I'm grateful and glad for that. And of course, my Lord, there are some friends, colleagues from the Chambers who are here today. And I would like to acknowledge publicly how pleased I am today to be their colleagues in, the, in that department. My Lord Chief Justice, my Lord, my Lady, I'm happy to announce that in attendance today is my learned and esteemed friend, Mr. Carlton Williams, of Williams, McCoy, and Palmer. When I graduated from 2 New Street, my Lord, I, I went into partnership with Mr. Williams at Willis McCoy and Palmer uptown. And it was indeed a wonderful period of my life, an almost irresponsible period. In those chambers, I never had to fix a fee with a client. I never had to collect it. I never worried about the maintenance of the chambers. I never had to order note paper. I never paid the secretary or clerk or staff. Mr. Williams did all of those things and more. He was a remarkable head of chambers, and he still is. And I, I want to thank him, of course, for, for that assistance and for his continued friendship. Finally, my lord, may I mention that we have today members of my family, my wife, Grace. I, I, I'm advising that she who must be obeyed is here with us, and my daughter, Renee. I had hoped to have other members. The, the, the registrar had given me some serious injunctions that I tried to live with them, but I had actually managed, I thought, to sneak my father-in-law in to these premises. I, I think, however, better sense prevailed, and I, we're not going to have him here today, except, of course, he's still very much in my, in my thoughts. Perhaps I should share with you, my lord, my lords and my lady, my first, my most challenging, my most important and indeed my most rewarding case. I clearly remember the Sunday afternoon when I tried to convince Ed, that's my father-in-law now, that I should be permitted to marry his daughter. <laughs> my parents were with me on one side of the living room, supporting my petition, I'm pleased to say. <laughs> my wife, no wife, Grace, Ed and the Mackey family were on the other side. We were separated by, by a coffee table, and the Mackeys were playing the roles of both respondents and presiding judge. <laughs> then I had few prospects. In, indeed, I was still living on the goodwill of my parents. But nevertheless, I, I won the day. I'm sure that Ed has had many opportunities to have regretted the outcome of that, of that, of that suit. But I hope that by now, I have convinced him that if you wait long enough, even the least promising son-in-law can achieve something after all. <laughs> my lords, my lady, after my wife, I have loved the law unremittingly. That love, that irrational love, began not when I started studying or when I graduated, even when I started teaching. That love began near the end of my first year of law school. When in a case note in the Modern Law Review, I saw that the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council had overturned the New Zealand Court of Appeal in New Zealand Shipping Company and Satterwith. I think we now call it the Remedion. For me, that case was an epiphany. My lords and ladies, I have had other important learning experiences. In my first experience in the Court of Appeal, challenging the length of a sentence on a robbery aggravation conviction, the learned president reminded me that it was in his power to increase the sentence. Until then, I had no idea that 
a defendant could lose on a criminal appeal. In my ignorance, I thought you would either win or you'd draw. As suitable punishment, the president had me spend the rest of the day justify the sentence the presiding judge had imposed. But I've had many other experiences, my lord. And may, may I, before I proceed, my lord, may, may, I, may I reassure you and to put to rest any doubt I have learned from the experience. But I've had other, other experiences. And the most important one I said earlier was the Eurymedon case. I counted it as, a, as myself at the beginning of my relationship with law. It's not that the case was that important. And indeed, there are clear hints in the English Court of Appeal that that outcome would have been possible. Obviously, I wasn't reading the law well enough to realize that. But that case seemed to contradict everything up to then I was taught on exemption clauses by Professor Ralph Carnegie. I then learned that the law could and did change in one's own lifetime. Until then, I thought such developments took place at an earlier time and at a different age. Now I'm seeing the law, I saw then the law change under my very eyes. More importantly, having had that experience, I could now confidently tell my law to, just no matter how eminent, I could, and indeed I could now say to any lawyers that they were wrong on one point of law at least. And that I think is the beginning of a lawyer, when you can stand with confidence and assert the law that others in fact then may not know. So my Lord Chief Justice, my Lord and my Lady, I confess that the Lord has been my love and my life. And in receiving this honor today, I've been invited in the bar. I hope to continue to prove myself to be his faithful partner. Indeed, more accurate than my Lord and my Lady, I wish to be his faithful servant. My Lord Chief Justice, my Lord Williams, my Lord Bessie, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Attorney General. And now may I invite the Honourable Mr. Justice Frank Williams, here representing the President of the Court of Appeal, who apparently is in court, to say a few words. Thank you very much, Chief Justice. Uh, may I first of all apologize for the absence of the Honourable Mr. Justice Brooks, President of the Court of Appeal, on whose behalf I am here. Uh, President Brooks had another commitment that he could not get out of and so he asked me to stand in for him. He also, of course, asked me to convey to you, Queen's Counsel McCoy, his sincere and warm congratulations on your admission to the inner bar. So on my own behalf, as well as on behalf of President Brooks and the other judges of the Court of Appeal, we extend to you sincere congratulations. Uh, time goes by so quickly, as I heard Mr. Williams of the Bar Association speak earlier. Uh, <laughs> I recall, as though it was only yesterday, the way Mr. Williams put it was uh, sopping up the morsels of knowledge that came. But I do recall that uh, Minister Chuck was my lecturer in criminal law as well, and uh, Mr. McCoy, my lecturer in constitutional law. And it was both of you who helped in our first year in the faculty to begin to, as it were, open our eyes to the arcana of the law. And teachers are expected to teach, lecturers are expected to lecture, and students are expected to learn. But I have not had the opportunity before now of thanking you both for laying that solid foundation in so many of us that has helped us to sit where we sit today. Uh, I am certain, Queen's Counsel McCoy, that this is by no means the final accolade and that you will continue to climb the ladder of success on which you have been for so long. Some of the matters Mr. Minister Chuck mentioned and there are others that have not been recounted here today and with which I am quite familiar. So once again, just to offer to you my sincere congratulations and best wishes in this new role. Thank you. May please. Thank you very much, Justice Williams. I can invite the senior puny judge, Honorable Mrs. Justice Carol Bezik, to say a few words. Thank you, 
Chief Justice, I join in congratulating Dr. McCoy on this very important step in his career. And I say that what has been said has been well said. Every compliment has been well deserved. He has worked hard, faithfully, well. I have to add on a personal note that I am particularly pleased to be here this morning because my husband, Captain Paul Beswick, now departed, regarded Dr. McCoy as a solid friend. And perhaps even more importantly, as a faithful brother. I know that, and I believe Dr. McCoy knows that. And there are others who are here present who know that. And Dr. McCoy would not be so regarded by my husband unless he truly deserved that. So I'm pleased because on a personal level also, I have known Dr. McCoy for decades. But this morning, more importantly, I believe I can represent your brother. By the same token, I will presume to represent your family, who are voiceless. But I know, because I have sat with them, I know that they love you and respect you and appreciate what you have done with them and for them. A life well lived, Dr. McCoy. And I congratulate you not only on being called to the inner bar, which is very, very important, but perhaps more importantly, on having lived and continuing to live such a stellar life. Congratulations, and I wish you continued success. Thank you very much, Senior Puny Judge. And as we bring this ceremony to a close, let me, I, I, I didn't do that at the beginning of my remarks, but let me associate with the remarks of the Learned Justice of Appeal in speaking to the foundation laid in us by Minister Chuck, Mr. McCoy, because they two were my lecturers when I we began in the Faculty of Law in 1981, a lecture in criminal law and constitutional law in the Faculty of Law, which was then located over by what is now the Faculty of the Humanities and, and the two classrooms that were down at the bottom, just outside of the um, where Dr. Marshall would, as they say, hold court it is with his history of the Caribbean lectures in, in the N1 classroom at the time. So let me express my thanks and appreciation to you both and the senior puny judge has mentioned the wife and daughter and family of Dr. McCoy. And in all these endeavors, we would not be able to accomplish these things that we have accomplished in our professional life without the support of our spouses and our family members. For those of us who practice law, and particularly those who excel in the discipline of the law, will know that we spend long hours in the days on weekends and holidays away from our family. And they have, and, and I suspect that when they, we first engaged them with proposals of marriage, they did not envisage that they would be um, <coughs> alone for such long and extended periods of time, extending over so many years. So I, I 
I won't say that Mrs. McCoy um, expressed the sentiments that my wife expressed to me some years ago where she said to me, you know, I wish I looked like a law book because you seem to look <laughs> <laughs> because you seem to look at them more frequently than you look at me. <laughs> so I wish to express my thanks and appreciation to you and my continued thanks and the country's thanks because you have once again agreed to permit him to serve in a very, very demanding job at a time when there is significant this thought about constitutional reform and all that that will entail. So I wish to thank you very much, Mrs. McCoy and Rene. And so it remains now for me to say these words, which are Queen's Council, do you move? And that being said, we'll now bring this ceremony to a close. Thank you all for attending. Thank you for all those who came to support Dr. McCoy and to be a part of this very important ceremony. Thank you all very much, and we'll now take the adjournment.